Okay, I think it's working now. All right, so hypothesis testing. I hope um, I hope we're gaining a, at least some appreciation for the subject of statistics, the idea of making conclusions from limited data. Um, you know, we we don't have to observe the entire population in order to say something about the population. Okay. We can take random samples of 60 people or 100 people, and based on these random samples, we can then make conclusions saying, you know, this group has a different average than this group, okay? And that's what we did with our um, two sample tests and, and things like that. So we're, we're now able to make conclusions from limited data. It shows up, you can imagine any time you're gathering data from a sample, statistics is going to play a part. So whether it's um, polling for elections or, um, you know, any, any kind of scientific field, making conclusions from the, uh, the data without having to look at the population. Uh, we've, got, we've got statistics going. All right, you guys, let's, uh, let's, let's quiet down, please. Okay, thanks. Okay, so um, as we go through hypothesis testing, though, okay, you can do all of the work correctly, and there is still an inherent risk of making well, what we call an error. Okay, and this is an unavoidable error inherent to the process of hypothesis testing. And this actually all stems from the, the fact that we are making conclusions about the population based on limited data, okay? So the great power of statistics is that we don't have to look at the population to say something about it. We can, we can get away with just looking at a sample. But the very fact that we're doing that also means that there's an inherent possibility that our sample is not representative of the population. Okay? So there is an inherent risk. that our random sample is not <clears throat> of the population. So the idea is that when we do a random sample, most of the time it is representative of the population. Okay, you flip a coin a hundred times, you should get something around 50 heads and 50 tails, okay? But because it is random, you might get something strange. It is technically possible to get 70 heads and 30 tails, okay? That would be highly unusual, and it would make you think that something is funny about the coin, but it is technically possible that because of the random process, we get something like that. Now, it's incredibly <laughs> unlikely. It's like less than one in a million that that could happen, but you could be that one in a million that flips the coin 100 times and gets 70 heads um, and 30 tails, okay? Most of the time, you're going to get something around 50 heads, 50 tails. Maybe you get 45 heads and 55 tails or something like that, but that's not that weird, okay? But because of the random process, it is technically possible that you get something um, uh, odd, okay? And so these errors, we, we have two types of errors, 
and we creatively named them type 1 error and type 2 error, okay? So type 1 error, this happens, okay, when the null hypothesis is true, but our data leads us to reject the null hypothesis, okay? So we didn't do anything wrong in the process, okay? We went through the process correctly, but we just happened to get weird data that led us to reject the null hypothesis even when the null hypothesis is true. That is a type 1 error, okay? So yeah, I'll write, in actuality, the null hypothesis, H0, is true. However, what's wrong with my writing here? However, our data leads us to reject the null hypothesis. Okay, so we we went through the process of hypothesis testing correctly. You know, we end up getting a p-value less than, you know, 0.05. We get, you know, p-value 0.02. So according to the rules of hypothesis testing, we reject the null hypothesis, but it turns out that the null hypothesis was actually true, okay? This happens if we just happen to get a weird case of data, okay? So, so that's type 1 error. Type 2 error, on the other hand, is the truth is, is that the null hypothesis is false. The truth is that null hypothesis is false, okay? So, so we should be rejecting our null hypothesis, okay? So we should reject the null hypothesis, okay? But either we do not have enough data, okay, so I'll say, um, I'll say we do not have enough data to reject the null, or our data, quote, misleads us. Do not reject the null. Okay. This is so does does that also make sense? So you know, maybe your null hypothesis is that mu is equal to 35, but in reality, mu is actually 38, okay? So if you have data, it should tell you to reject the null hypothesis because mu is something else. But for whatever reason, maybe you don't have enough data, or the data, for whatever reason, looks very similar to mu equal to 35 or whatever, you don't reject the null hypothesis, okay? And so that's that's the other possible error that we make. Okay, so we have type 1 and type 2 error. Okay, so keep this in mind. These are just errors that are inherent to the process of hypothesis testing. We're hoping that most of the time we do it correctly. Okay, but sometimes just because we're making conclusions based on limited data, we can't avoid this. So let's, uh, let's try an example and talk about what it means to make a type 1 error. Okay, so let's say we have a problem, okay, and we'll say, uh, you know, in whatever, in the 60s, the average age, a man married, was 23.3 years. Okay? Okay, you gather, you take a random sample,
of let's say 50 men. Okay. <clears throat> you go through the hypothesis test. You do a hypothesis test. to see if the average age a man marries today is higher than 23.3 years. Okay. All right, um, so let's say, what does it mean to commit a type one error in this scenario? Okay, so let's think about this, okay? So what is the definition of a type 1 error? So type 1 error is the null hypothesis is true, right? But our data leads us to reject the null hypothesis. Okay with everyone? Okay, so in this problem, what would our null hypothesis have been? And what would our alternative hypothesis have been? Yeah, so the null hypothesis is marriage age remain the same, or I'll say average marriage age is the same, or in other words, symbolically, we would write mu is equal to 23.3, right? And then the alternative would be average marriage age is now higher. And that would be mu is now greater than 23.3. Is that okay? All right, so type one error means the null hypothesis is true, but our data leads us to reject the null. So what, what does that mean okay. happened? So that means today, so if so if we do a type 1 error, so type 1 error means okay, today the average age of marriage is what? is still 23.33. Okay, that's what that's what it means for the null hypothesis to be true. It means the average age of marriage today is still 23.3. Okay? But for whatever reason, but our data leads us to believe that the average age is now higher. That's what a type 1 error would be. Okay. <clears throat> Are there any uh, questions? Does this make sense? Okay. What about a type 2 error? So type 2 error is uh, is the flip of this, okay? Or not the flip, but... Okay, type 2 error means the null hypothesis is false, 
but our data leads us to not reject the null hypothesis. Not to reject. Okay. So you've got to learn type 1 and type 2 error. Okay. You're not going to get a note card for next week's quiz. So type 1, just say these things to yourself, all right? Type 1, the null is true, but you reject it. Type 2, the null is false, but you did not reject it. So type 2 error would be what happens in this case. Today the marriage age is, is not 23.3. It's actually more than 23.3. Okay, so in truth, average marriage age is now over 23.3. Okay. But for whatever reason, but when we did the hypothesis test, we do not reject the null hypothesis. Okay? Or when we, I should say, but when we do the hypothesis test, we conclude, I should say, we conclude um, that we have no evidence to say it is over 23.3. Okay. Now, now notice I'm I'm writing kind of this clunky thing. We conclude that we have no evidence to say that it is over 23.3. <laughs> I did not write. We conclude that the marriage age is still 23.3, okay? Because remember, we always either reject the null or don't reject the null, okay? We never conclude that we that the null is true, okay? So we we never actually conclude that the null is true. We just don't reject it. So we say we have no evidence to say that it is not 23.3, okay? Is, it, is this, okay, ideas of type 1 and type 2 error? That's okay. <clears throat> so, um, the probability of committing a type 1 error is equal to alpha, okay? What is alpha? Okay, alpha is our significance level okay? It is often 0 0.05 but sometimes we can pick a larger alpha or a smaller alpha depending on the circumstances, okay? Okay, it is often But we can also pick alpha to be, you know, 0 0.01 or 0 0.10 or really any other number. Okay. Our choice of alpha actually reflects our willingness to commit a type 1 error. Yeah, alpha is the significance level. That's the definition of alpha. Okay, and, and we've already encountered that, right? We say when your p-value is less than alpha, you reject the null. If the p-value is bigger than alpha, you don't reject the null. Right? So, 
our um, our choice of alpha is our willingness to commit a type 1 error. So if I say alpha is 0 0.05, it means I'm willing to commit a type 1 error about 5% of the time. Okay. So if you say, well, I don't want to ever want to commit a type 1 error, okay? Why don't I just pick a tiny alpha? Well, the trade-off is, is when you pick a smaller alpha, if you want to decrease the probability of a type 1 error, something happened here. Um, if you want to decrease your, the probability of a type 1 error, you are inherently increasing the probability of a type 2 error. Okay? Because if you want to say, well, I don't want to uh, reject the null, so I want to be extra cautious before I reject the null, then you're going to be not rejecting it as often as you should. Okay? And so you can think of two, uh, maybe you can think of two types of people, the one who takes too many risks in life and the one who doesn't take enough risks in life, right? And so you have the person who likes to play it safe all the time. Maybe they're playing it safe, they don't get into trouble, but they might miss out on opportunities in life. And then the other person maybe takes too many risks and uh, and sometimes that gets, in, gets them into trouble. But they won't miss out on very many opportunities either if uh, you know unless something happens and it causes a sequence of events or something uh, like out of a movie but um, you know so this this about you know our selection of 0 0.05 is kind of what scientists and researchers have kind of decided as being the balance between too much risk or too little risk but you know depending on the circumstance Maybe you don't, you want a bigger alpha or a smaller alpha, okay? So, um, so decreasing alpha will decrease the risk of type 1 error. But will also increase risk of type 2 error. Okay. On the other hand, increasing alpha increases the type, uh, I'll say, increasing alpha will decrease the risk of type 2 error. but increases the risk of type 1 error. Okay. So the probability of committing a type 1 error is alpha. We have a question? Yeah. Are, are we thinking of given alpha or decreasing? So, so if we're doing a hypothesis test, um, either the problem will tell you which alpha to use, or if it doesn't, you assume that it's 0 0.05. Okay. All I'm saying is what you know. What are the consequences of picking you know different levels of alpha? Okay. Because technically, when you do research, you get to pick the alpha yourself. Okay. So technically, that that choice is yours but you should know what happens when you do that, okay? You shouldn't just say, oh, I feel like using alpha this today because it's sunny outside, okay? It's like, I don't know. All right. <clears throat> so um, anyway, the probability of committing a type 2 error Uh, we give it the letter beta, okay? So alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Beta is the second letter of the Greek alphabet. That's where we get the word alphabet. Alpha, beta, gamma, 
Delta Echo Foxtrot. That's that's the phonetic alphabet, not the Greek one. It's Delta Epsilon, yeah, whatever. Okay. Um, so committing a type 2 error. There we go. Oh, it's actually Alpha Bravo Charlie, I think. Yeah, who cares? Um, committing a type 2 error is beta. And then we assign something to the value 1 minus beta. Okay, so 1 minus beta. So remember, this is a probability. What is 1 minus a probability? It would be the complement, right? Okay, so what is the complement of committing a type 2 error? No, it's not alpha. So 1 minus beta we call power, and this would be the probability of what? It's the complement of committing a type 2 error. Not committing a type 2 error. Okay, so what does it mean to not commit a type 2 error? <laughs> this is the, uh, the brain twister of all, right? So let's just flip back a couple slides. So type 2 error is the truth is that the null is false, and uh, we should reject the null, but we conclude not to reject the null. Okay. So type 2 error and the null is false, but we conclude not to reject it. So the complement of that would be the... Da, 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 da. Okay, so the complement would be the null is false, and we conclude to reject it. Okay, and that's a good thing. Okay, right? If the null is false, we want to reject it. The probability of us making that correct decision is known as the power of the test. So it's the probability of us of correctly rejecting the null. when the null is false, okay? It's a good thing. Right? If the null is false, we should reject it. So the power is the probability that we make that correct decision. Okay, so Let's see if we understand everything, okay? Can we put everything together? <laughs> no. Yes. The probability of you correctly answering this next question, given that I have told you all of this junk. Okay. Increasing, um, if we want to increase, if we increase alpha, what effect will that have on the power? Increasing alpha will increase power or decrease power? <laughs> you guys can't make up your minds. Um, increasing alpha will increase power. Okay? Okay? But it also increases what bad thing? So increasing power is a good thing, but it increases what? Increases type 1 error, okay? Okay, what about decreasing alpha? Decreasing alpha will do what to the power? Will decrease the power. Decrease power and will decrease type 2 error, type 1 error. Can we keep this all straight in our head? No. <laughs> all right. Okay, let's... Uh, huh? They're both type Yeah, yeah. Decreasing alpha is directly... or Alpha is directly related to type 1 error. Okay? So you increase alpha, type 1 error goes up. Decrease alpha, type 1 error goes down. Okay? But the, on the other hand... Decreasing alpha decreases your power. Okay, we generally want lots of power. Okay, but we don't we don't want to have too much type one error either. Okay. Um, the best way to increase power to increase power without increasing type one error or increasing alpha, you can 
gather more data. Okay, so one way to increase power without increasing alpha and this type 1 error without increasing alpha is to gather more data. Okay, what's the downside of gathering more data? Money. Takes more time. Takes more, costs more money. But if you had unlimited resources, you'd get as much data as you can, right? Once every 10 years, our government conducts a census. It's very, very expensive to do a census, okay? You gotta they hire all these temp workers that go out to the neighborhoods, try to track down people. Um, does every country do a census? Probably not. I can't imagine them doing a census in like China or something. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe they do, but you know. So for places like that that don't do censuses, that sensei or whatever, um, I imagine they just use statistics, pretend like they know what they're talking about. Um, okay. So here we go. Uh, one way to increase power without increasing alpha is to gather more data, but that of course costs more money. All right. I, um, earlier I said we can choose alpha to be big or small. Um, when would we want a large alpha? When would we want a small alpha? Okay, so let's, uh, so I'll, I'll write this. We want big alpha when committing a type 2 error is worse than committing a type 1 error. Okay, ideally we don't want to commit any errors. Okay. But we want a big alpha when committing a type 2 error is worse than committing a type 1 error. Okay? And we want a small alpha. when a type 1 error is worse than a type 2 error. So let's talk about what let's try to think of scenarios here. Or I'll, I'll give you scenarios. Is this alright? Does this make sense? No or yes? Okay, so all right, so in either case, we don't want to make errors. But if we were forced to have to make an error, okay, we have to decide, is it worse to do a type 1 error or a type 2 error? And, and we'll get into scenarios here, okay? So because alpha and type 1 error are directly linked, if type 1 error is worse than type 2 error, we don't want to commit type 1 error very often, so we pick a small alpha. If type 2 error is worse than type 1 error, we don't want to commit type 2 very often, we'd rather commit type 1, so we pick a big alpha. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's, let's think of this scenario. Okay, so think of a uh, smoke detector. Or let's a uh, fire alarm. Okay, fire alarm, smoke detector. Okay, what is the job of a smoke detector fire alarm? What's it supposed to do? It's supposed to it's supposed to sound an alarm when there's a fire, right? That's its number one job. That's why you buy it. What, what is it also supposed to do that you don't think about this? You don't think about this, but until it, it doesn't do this. Now, you buy a separate thing, carbon monoxide detector for carbon monoxide. 
what is a smoke alarm supposed to do? And you don't even think about it until it, it's not doing this job. No, it's, no. The opposite, it's supposed to be quiet when there's no fire, okay? That, those are the two jobs of a fire alarm, okay? Make noise when there is a fire, be quiet when there's no fire, okay? Now, you don't think about the other one until you start getting false alarms and you're like, oh my gosh, I gotta throw this thing away. Um, so anyway, we assume that the null is true unless our data points out otherwise. So in this case, what would the null hypothesis be? There is a fire or there is no fire? Yeah, that's correct. So the null hypothesis is that there is no fire. And the alternative is what? There is a fire. Okay. And then, you know, the data would, in this case, would be smoke. So if it detects enough smoke, it rejects the null, sounds the alarm. Okay. So proper operation. If the null hypothesis is true, it is quiet. And proper operation, if null hypothesis is false, it sounds an alarm. Okay, so those, that's the proper operation. A working fire alarm would do these two things. Okay, what would a type 1 error be? For a smoke alarm. So type 1 error is rejecting the null when the null is true. So this would be no fire, but it sounds an alarm. Okay, so we would call that a false alarm. That's a type 1 error. What is a type 2 error? There is a fire. but there's no alarm. Okay. All right, which which type of error is worse? Type 2, type two right? This so type 1 error is annoying, but type 2 error is potentially tragic, right? So type 2 error is worse. Okay? So do we want to pick a large alpha or a small alpha? Large alpha. Okay, we want a large alpha. Okay, meaning we're going to reject the null as soon as there's any data that says, oh, something might be up, we're going to be like, oh my gosh, let's sound the alarms, okay? Type 2, type 2. Sorry if my handwriting looks not good. Type 2 error is worse, okay? So they make fire alarms sensitive, right? You burn some toast, me, 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 okay? So, <clears throat> you know, a friend is smoking out on the balcony and the uh, smoke detector's there, it might set it off, okay? So, no, um, we don't want this because if it, they make them extra sensitive because a type 2 error is worse. Does that make sense? Okay. Let me give you a, a scenario where a type 1 error is worse. I'm already giving you the answer here, but okay. So think of a criminal case. Okay. They always say, you know, they don't, they don't, Cops isn't on TV anymore, right? Do you guys remember that show, Cops? Um, is it still on? It's like on Spike or something, you know? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, 
what do they always say at the end of those shows? They always say, uh, you know, people are always assumed innocent unless proven guilty in a court of law, right? At least, you know, that's how it's set up in America. And so we assume that the null is true. So in this case, is the null hypothesis that the defendant is guilty or the defendant is innocent? Yeah, so we assume the null. So in this case, we assume the defendant, defendant is innocent. And the alternative is the defendant is guilty. Okay. So, you know, proper outcomes of a trial is if the null hypothesis is true, defendant is found not guilty. Okay. Or I'll, I'll say jury decides. not guilty. And if the null hypothesis is false, the jury decides what? The jury decides guilty. So those are the uh, proper outcomes of a trial, okay? If everything goes well. Okay, now there are two possible errors. We have type one error and type two error. Okay, what is a type 1 error in this scenario? So the type 1 error is the null hypothesis is true, but we reject the null. So type 1 error is defendant is innocent. but jury says guilty. Okay, and type two error is the defendant is actually guilty, but is acquitted, right? But is found not guilty. Yeah, okay. So, you know, I mean, this is up for debate, but uh, the way our justice system is formed or designed, it was designed under the presumption that a type one error is worse. Ideally, we don't want to make either of these mistakes, right? Ideally, when someone is guilty, they're found guilty. And ideally, when someone is innocent, they're found not guilty, okay? But no system is perfect, okay? These are just inherent risks of trying to figure out what happened when you don't have all the information, okay? When you don't have all the information, there are mistakes inherent to the system. And so <clears throat> what do they say? Kind of, so, so I'm, I'm gonna tell you, type one error is, was decided worse when our, our court system was set up, okay? So type one error is worse. So that means we want large alpha or small alpha, okay? So we want small alpha. Okay, and they actually say this in court. They don't say use a small alpha, but what do they say? They charge the jury. <coughs> they say, before you come to a guilty verdict, you want to be, what, sure beyond a reasonable doubt, okay? They don't, they don't want you to just go off of a hunch and say, ah, I think this guy's guilty. It seems like, eh, it seems like he, he might be uh, guilty or she might be guilty. They want you to be sure beyond a reasonable doubt, meaning use a small alpha, okay? So if there's a reasonable doubt, don't convict. That's, that's how the system is set. Now, you know, we can all think of high profile cases where, you know, usually the televised ones, everyone's like, oh my gosh, this person is guilty. And then the jury says, not guilty. And they say, these are failures of the justice system. Well, these are just inherent mistakes, right? If you have a system set up 
where type 1 error is worse, and I would, I would agree with that. We don't want to be locking away innocent people. Um, that means you're going to be making type 2 error more often, okay? I think, you know, if anybody listened to the serial podcast, I think part of the reason why the podcast was so compelling was because it brought into the question, did they commit a type 1 error, okay? And I think there's something, well, at least as an American with American values, there's something that resonates with you that says that's, that's a terrible thing to do. Okay, so that is type 1 and type 2 error. Um, so I'm going to move on here, and now I want to talk about sampling methods. And this is the stuff that's in Chapter uh, 12. What was all this stuff on? Uh, chapters, I want to say, 8 and 9. I think it kind of, in the, in the text of 8 and 9, it kind of gets into this. Um, but it kind of glossed over it earlier. And so we covered it a little bit more in depth today, okay? So there are uh, four sampling methods that I want you to be familiar with, okay? Now, why do we draw samples to begin with in the first place? Okay. So we draw samples. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to just... Power through, and then we'll probably finish maybe 15, 20 minutes early, okay? If that's cool with you guys. Yeah, I didn't think I was... <clears throat> uh, okay, so we draw samples from the population. Because we cannot observe the population directly, okay? Because we do not have the resources... to study the entire population. Okay. So ideally, our samples are representative of the population. Okay, and so we have four methods that will help us get four methods to select samples. Okay. One, SRS or simple random sampling. Two, stratified sampling. Three is cluster sampling. And four is systematic sampling. Okay. All right. So let's uh, let's just talk about each one of these, and then uh, and then I'll let you go. Stratified cluster systematic. Okay, so the first method, simple random sampling. What's the last? Systematic sampling was the last one on the other page. Systematic. Simple random sampling, SRS here. This is the one we've already discussed 
whenever we say a sample is drawn randomly, we mean simple random sampling. Okay, and this means um, we have a sampling frame of the population. We have a sampling frame. which ideally is every single person in the population. Ideally, a list of every single person, person or thing in the population, okay? And then all we do is we use a random device to select individuals one by one from the sampling frame. hard work writing while talking. <clears throat> we having a good time here, all right. Okay, so we use a random device to select individual, individuals one by one from the sampling frame, okay? The difficulty, so this is, this is the process. Maybe I should write one, two. That's the process of simple random sampling. Straightforward and simple enough, okay? The challenge is getting the sampling frame. And getting, whoa. <laughs> um, getting, getting, oh my gosh. Stop. Um, <clears throat> Getting, getting a list of every single person in the population. Is this, uh, okay, I think we're back to normal. <clears throat> getting a list of every single person in the population is, uh, I hate this, is, is actually very difficult to do. All right. I know. Life is hard. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just talk loud. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, if I said get a list of every single person in Los Angeles County, it's close to impossible. Okay. Uh, most of the recordings are video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I have a microphone on my computer, cool. so um, this is this is for you guys. This is for the computer. I got my whole tech set up here. All right. Uh, so it's that simple random sampling. Um, okay. Let's talk about stratified sampling. Okay. So sometimes our population consists of different groups. Um, sharing sharing a trait. I'll, I'll just say different groups. Um, different groups. Okay, so for example, uh, you can split a population up by gender. or you can split a population by race or some other characteristic, okay? Split a population into groups Okay, so whatever, whatever you decide, okay? Now, maybe um, you're asking a 
question and you think gender is going to play a role in the answer, right? So maybe it's the question about women's rights, whatever whatever that means, okay? Um, so you think maybe uh, the, the person who's answering their gender will influence their answer, okay? Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, so maybe um, in that case, you want to make sure your sample is representative, representative of the population with regard to this aspect, okay? Because when you do random sampling, um, let's say the population is 50% male, 50% female, okay? When you do random sampling, because it's random sampling, you might get 55% male and 45% female, okay? And that the fact that you got a sample that was 55% male and 45% female might affect uh, the results of your survey or questions, okay? So, <clears throat> so in this uh, in this case, you want to make sure you get um, you get a sample that's also 50% male and 50% female, okay? So, um, uh, so in stratified sampling. You pick your sample so that the proportions of the sample match the proportions of the population. Of population, okay? with respect to whatever uh, you know the the attribute you use okay now this you should it's it's extra work to do stratified sampling okay cuz you need to know the proportions in the population and you've got to pick your sample accordingly so it's extra work. So you should really only do it if you suspect that you know the results of your study are affected by whatever aspect you're you're, you're looking at. Okay. Hey, let's let's try this over. Gosh, it's still really loud. Maybe maybe this is better. I don't know. Okay. So you know if you uh, if you're gonna do a survey. Now is it too quiet? Can we still hear me or no? Whatever. Okay. Um, so if you're going to do a survey on, I don't know, immigration or something, and you think the people's uh, ethnicity plays a role into their response, maybe you want to do stratified sampling, making sure different ethnicities are properly represented. Okay. Otherwise, you can just do simple random sampling because it's extra work to do stratified sampling. Does that make sense, stratified sampling? Because you don't want to leave it up to random chance because you're worried that it might affect your, your responses. Okay, so let's talk about cluster sampling. Whatever attribute you selected, so whether that's race, ethnicity, gender, whether they wear glasses or not, okay? Okay, cluster sampling is a way to help us, uh, helps us get somewhat representative samples easier without creating a sampling frame, okay? Allows us to get, you know, fairly representative samples without a true sampling frame. Okay, 
So in this case, the population um, <clears throat> is naturally divided into uh, groups, which we call clusters. And here it is, it is easy to get a list of all the clusters. Okay. And so in this process, okay, we take our list of clusters. and randomly select some of them. Okay. Okay, then we do uh, random sampling within the selected clusters. So for example, let's say you wanted to do a random sample of, uh, of everyone. Here, I'll, I'll let you guys finish writing. You want to get a random sample of everyone who attends, um, attends church, OK? It would be tough to get a sampling frame, because you would need to get the sampling frame would be every single person who attends church. And that would be difficult to do. So let's say we were just doing Los Angeles County. It'd be difficult to get a list of every single person who attends church. But it would be relatively easy to get a list of all the churches in Los Angeles County. Okay, And so maybe there's, I don't know, 300 churches in LA County. I have no idea. Okay, So with cluster sampling, you wouldn't pick individuals. You would first randomly select you know, 30 random churches or something like that. Okay, you randomly select some churches from the list of all the churches. And then once you've selected those 30 churches, then you go to each church and you do random sampling within um, the congregation of people who attend that church. Okay, so that way you, oh gosh, that way you get kind of a representative sample. Okay. Whatever, okay. Enough, enough. Okay, so um, so that's cluster sampling. Okay, you don't need to get a list of every single person at first. You get a list of clusters, and then you randomly select the clusters. And once you've selected the clusters, then you do either random sampling or you could survey every single person in that cluster, whatever you want to do. And that's that's how you do uh, cluster sampling. Okay, does that make sense? And then the last one is systematic sampling. This is probably the easiest to comprehend. Okay. Okay. This uh, works best with uh, a line or Q. <laughs> Q is such a funny word. It's like Here's the letter Q, and let's keep adding letters. U E U E. Okay, with well, a line or Q of of people. Okay, uh, and what you do is you just you select every nth person. So like every fifth person that goes through line, or every tenth person that goes through line, you select for random as part of your random sample. Okay. Nth, 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 or n is any number, okay? So for example, okay, select every tenth person 
that walks through the door. Okay, and that would be systematic sampling. Okay, or um, yeah, I, I guess you could have another form of systematic sampling. For example, um, the person goes through the line, but then you have them roll a die or you have them do something random, like they reach into a, a bag and they pull out a ball. And if you know the ball turns out black, then they're selected, or if it's uh, you know something like that, okay? Um, which is, you know, if they wanted to do truly random screening at the airport in a transparent manner, they could do that, right? They would just have a die like, and then you would say you walk through the thing and then if you roll the die and if it comes up on the side, on the red side or whatever, then you get pulled aside for additional screening, okay? And that would be a transparent and perfectly fair method that nobody would complain about, but um, I think we have our suspicions that the, when they say random selection for additional screening, it's not truly random, okay? So. Um, but that would, that would be a method, a systematic method for um, selecting people at random. Or they could just say every 10th person that goes through the, uh, the gate or whatever um, gets selected or whatever, but, um, but that's not how it goes. Okay, so that's, uh, that's that. Um, so on the quiz, you know, I'll put up maybe like a sample quiz where I'm gonna list off different things. And you just have to identify with the sampling method and I'll have asked questions about type one and type two error as well. Okay. Um, th this week, so uh, as you, s the the homework is, this week is super super easy. The main part of your homework that I want you to do is to download the practice final and work through that. Okay, work through the practice final because we're going to go over that next week. So that's going to be your main homework. Okay, have a good week.